Panasonic first released their full frame mirrorless camera line earlier this year, and we were really impressed with the image quality of the S1. But now we are looking at a whole new beast. This is the Panasonic S18. The S1H has seen a range of improvements and changes over the regular S1. For this review, we are going to be breaking it down to four parts. The physical differences, software differences, internal tech specs, and reflection on our time using the camera in a creative environment. The chassis of the S1H is very similar to the S1, but has received a fair bit of extra bulk. Let's walk around the camera and explore the changes. Starting with the top, the S1H is a slightly redesigned button layout. It features a new large record button, keeps the three exposure adjustment buttons, but now has the on-off switch at the front of the shutter, as well as the light trigger for the new huge 1.8 inch status LCD screen. This screen's layout changes when you switch between movie mode and stills mode. This is so you can see more video orientated features like your audio levels, time code, and the amount of runtime on your card. In the menu, you can also invert the character and background color and adjust the backlight intensity so you can see the screen in different lighting conditions. You can also choose whether you want the battery life as well as your runtime on your cards to be displayed while the camera is powered off. Moving on to the bottom, you have the same DMW BLJ31E battery as the S1 and the S1R, and the same battery door design, which you can remove if you want to use a dummy battery to detap, for example. You also have a quarter inch thread on the bottom with a locating pin. However, I think it would have been better if Panasonic had replaced this with a second mounting point, as people would much rather have this than this locating pin. You also have the connections for the battery grip, and that's about it. Moving on to the right side, we then have two SD card slots. Both of these SD card slots are UHS-2 and V90 compatible. This is a change over the S1, which was XQD and SD. However, I think two SD card slots is a much smarter choice over the one XQD and one SD, because it saves you running around with two different types of media if you want to shoot with both slots. With dual SD slots also come three different recording modes, relay, backup, and allocation. It also features the same card lock as the S1, which will sound an alarm if you open the card door while data is being recorded. On the left-hand side, you have a remote port, a mic input, a headphone jack, a USB-C port, and a full-size HDMI port, as well as a huge exhaust vent running along all of the I.O. The two interesting ports here are the USB-C and HDMI. The USB-C is only for power input and not data currently. When we shot with the S1 earlier this year, we used this USB-C port a lot as we only had one battery with the lone camera. This means you can use simple battery banks or DTAP power sources with USB outputs. It would be awesome if Panasonic would allow you to record externally also. We will come back to the HDMI once we talk about the codex that the camera can record internally. On the front you have a range of buttons, a custom function button, a preview button that can be redefined, the lens release button, a self timer lamp and AF assist lamp a front tally lamp, another record button, a flash sync slash time code in and out socket, and a front dial for controlling settings. Finally, we have the L mount, which was used in the original S1. This mount is pretty great because it has such great support for adapting lenses due to its 20 mm flange depth. This means you can mount a pretty large amount of lenses onto it with the correct adapter. The key ones at the moment are the Sigma MC21, which is for EF lenses, the Leica and wooden camera PL adapters, and Kipon's range of adapters, the most in interesting of the lot being the medium format speed boosters. Behind the L mount is where the new 6K or 24.2 megapixel 36 by 24 mm sensor lies. This sensor claims to provide over 14 stops of the dynamic range, two native ISOs of 640 and 4000, and has the same sensor stabilization as the S1. We will come back to this when we look at the image it can produce. Finally, onto the back of the camera. Here, we have a very similar layout to the S1, with the only changes being the record button being replaced by a tally light and the new super swivelly screen and vents for heat management. I kind of wish that Panasonic had removed the EVF a little bit. I think it, not having an EVF would have positioned it slightly more as a video camera, but I can understand why they kept it. 
because it's a great EVF. One idea I mentioned to Panasonic was then possibly adding the function of making it a director's viewfinder. I think this would be an awesome addition and give it a really unique feature that would separate it out from other systems. The addition of the two big vents on the side of the screen really make the camera look a lot beefier than the S1. These vents offer the new improved cooling system that helps manage all of the heat created by the big sensor and big recording formats. You can control this fan in the menu, but we'll get into that in a bit. I'm happy to see the record button that was next to the EVF on the S1 disappear, as it was really awkwardly placed, um, and having a tally light in its place is really handy. Panasonic adding the flippy swivelly screen to the S1H is also great, and I wish this mechanic was on the S1 also. The bracket for adjusting the 3.2 inch screen is sturdy and the touch screen is accurate. I can see the tilty flippy screen being quite handy when the camera is fully rigged up, especially with the Panasonic's addition of the E1 control layout that brings us on nicely to the menu system. The menu on the S1H is very similar to the S1. It's broken down nice and simply, and you can create your own custom menu to make accessing key settings much, much faster but there have been a huge addition of menu changes and UI changes. This is the first time a control panel like this has been implemented into a DSLR or mirrorless form factor camera, and it's a welcome addition at that. It will make controlling vital settings so much quicker. You have your current FPS, which you can change when in variable frame rate mode, your shutter speed or angle, iris control for when you're using lenses that pass through that communication, ISO, which depending on which native ISO mode you're in will have you show a different range. You can choose between low, high, and auto, Photo style, which will allow you to quickly access the different color profiles like V-Log, HLG, or flat, and also then make tweaks on them like contrast and sharpness. Lastly, you have your white balance. Other than that, you have a range of information that you can easily see and access and change. This M allows you to quickly change between exposure modes. MM is your meter, you then have your time code, and then your codec. Tapping on this will allow you to cycle through all of the codec options in the current file format you are in. They've separated out each resolution into one of five submenus. This makes switching between the codecs much simpler as there is a lot. You then have this handy readout about your recording media. This shows you what recording media you are in, what your destination card is, and the runtime remaining of each card. You can then see the fan profile you're in. I wish you could also see the temperature of your sensor, like red, do, and then a battery readout. You then have your audio settings. Tapping on the far left will bring up the option for to put on a level limiter. Tapping on the levels will bring up your level adjustments. Overall, the addition of this menu will make a lot of operators feel slightly more at home on this camera if they are used to more traditional cinema or video camera navigation and menu systems. This menu has been designed to be used while using an external monitor, so if you don't want to use this, you can use the display button to cycle through back to a more traditional live view experience. This camera has a lot of codecs. In total, including all of the three different recording formats, there are 52 different options. This system allows you to filter all of the codecs down by a range of the different variables and then display those codecs that line up with your choices. However, you can take this a step further and create a list of your favorite codecs and formats. These are added in the order you add them and not sorted by resolution. This is such an awesome feature because it means you can limit the codecs down to the ones you know you're going to be using instead of having to filter or scroll through the huge list of codec options. Unlike the S1, the S1H actually allows you to control your exposure manually when you're recording in variable frame rate mode. I'm including this like it's a feature, but it's not. It's pretty basic and the S1 should have it. Unlike the S1, you now have the ability to also change how you expose your camera. You can now switch between the following. Shutter speed and ISO, shutter angle and ISO, and lastly, shutter speed and dB. This means you can choose the mode you are more comfortable with, depending on what you've used previously. I personally keep it in angle and ISO mode for the most part, but little details like this show the market this camera is aimed at. Unlike the S1, which requires a paid upgrade to get V-Log, this camera has it pre-installed. It uses the same V-Log and V-Gamma as the Varicam series, so it should be very easy to match to them if you're using it as a B or C camera. You also have a range of other color profiles to choose from. With the V-Log, you also have the ability to load in LUTs into the camera. However, this isn't an easy process. Panasonic use VLT as their LUT format, which means you will have to either create VLT LUTs through Resolve or use a piece of software like LUTCalc to convert your favorite 3D or cube LUTs to VLT. Once you have this, there are then a few more hoops you have to jump through. You'll need to copy the VLT onto the root of your SD card and then rename it so that the name is no longer than three letters. If it's longer, the camera will not see it. You can then eject your media, plug it into the camera, and then hop onto the second tab, head down to the monitor display three page, and click on Vlog View Assist. The read LUT file option will allow you to now ingest the LUT 
select your media type, the LUT you want to import, and then, you'll have, and then you can select which one of four slots you'd like to save it into. Once loaded, you can head into LUT Select and choose your LUT there. This gives you as much data to manipulate in post with the added benefit of being able to monitor. You also have HOG Assist, which you can choose to change between your onboard and monitor and HDMI in a few different modes. One huge addition to the camera is the ability to shoot in a range of anamorphic modes. You have the ability to shoot in a 4x3 crop of the sensor, which is 3328 by 2496 in resolution. The highest quality codec is a 422 10-bit all-eye 400 megabits a second codec, which can be shot at 24, 25, or 29.97p. Anamorphic has become an extremely popular option for a lot of filmmakers, so having this option is great. The camera also comes with pretty much every D-squeeze ratio you could want in a camera. Pair that with the ability to mount PL lenses on there, you can use a huge range of anamorphic lenses on this system. You'll also be able to use IBIS in anamorphic modes which is quite a unique feature for Super 35 Anamorphic. You also have a huge range of monitoring assist tools, such as monochrome live view, a center mark toggle, the ability to add video frame markers for a range of aspect ratios, and the ability to adjust the frame color and the opacity of that mask. You also have zebras, which, which you define the two percentages for quick access. You also have a 10-bit waveform or histogram option, you can then drag this over the screen to, to, to whatever position you want and also adjust the size of it using the top right scroll wheel. Once it's in position, you can also tap on it while in live view and move it about the screen and also adjust the size again. This is great if you want to change the position of it quickly and easily while shooting in more run and gun environments. The vector scope works the same way but cannot be resized. You also have the ability to toggle a red frame that will appear around the edges of the frame when you hit record. I really like this addition. Focus peaking is the same as other Panasonic mirrorless cameras. You can set sensitivity, color, and whether you want it to be displayed while using autofocus. You also have the ability to output color bars and a test tone. For this, you have three different standards, SMPTE, EBU, and ARIB. With the addition of the large vents on the back, there is also the ability to control the speeds and profiles of the fans. Currently, you have Auto 1, Auto 2, Normal, and Slow. Both of the auto profiles will ramp the speed of the fan depending on the temperature of the sensor, with Auto 2 having more priority to set to keep the fans off. Normal keeps it at a constant speed, and Slow does the same but at a lower speed. I wish Panasonic could have added a temperature gauge and released the optimal temperature range for the sensor to sit at while recording and give the user the option to set a custom fan profile based on the temperatures. Hopefully this is something they can add in a firmware update. Two tally lights at the front and back of the camera can also be controlled via the menu system. You can choose between them both toggling, either one or disabling them. This is handy as you may not want these lights distracting in certain shooting environments. This was a very interesting feature to stumble across. Live cropping allows you to create either a 20 second clip or 40 second clip with pan or zoom movements across the sensor. You select your starting point and your end point. You can adjust the size of the frame, using the back wheel, so you can either zoom or pan using this. This could make for some interesting shots, which can be achieved very easily in camera. Obviously, the limitation here is the final clip will be 1080p, as you are essentially using the full sensor to perform these movements, and you can zoom in so much that 4K delivery isn't possible. Though, it would be cool to have a 4K mode where the size of the zooms and pans are slightly reduced. It would also be cool to have customizable times as well as the two presets. As well as this, this mode you have the ability to shoot time lapses in camera. Another cool automation feature is the focus transition. This feature was in the GH5 also. You can program three focus pull points and then tap to pull between them. You can change the transition speed also and add a delay to execute the focus pull. To me, these pulls look a little too electronic for me, but it's handy in case you need these in a pinch. Once you've set the positions, you can change the speed of the transition. SH being the fastest, SL being the longest, and the next option defines what position you want to be at when you hit record. Of course, there are some features I have missed, so here's a quick list of other awesome things. Illuminated buttons, segment file recording for preventing data loss, luminance level adjustment for 10-bit, night mode, which turns the screen red, 20 times manual focus assist, lock lever, which can be customized, unlimited video recording, even in higher bit rates, Focus ring customization for focus by wire lenses, adjustable noise reduction, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 4.2, and it's compatible with the DMW-XLR1 adapter. The HDMI on our pre-production unit didn't work fully, but upon release, you'll be able to output 42 10-bit 
but Panasonic have not released the full details of this yet. Could this mean Pro is raw? Potentially, we hope so. This camera has an insane amount of codecs. Across MOV, MP4 and AVCHD, there is 52 different modes. This is insane. This handy table was provided by Panasonic and is really detailed. To shoot in 6K, you have to be in the cinema mode. However, you can still record some beefy codecs. The main ones that caught my eye were the 6K 3x2, 5.9K 16x9, Cinema 4K 4210-bit all eye at 400 megabits a second, and the Anamorphic 4K 4x3, 422 10-bit all eye 400 megabits a second. There are a range of different colors of sampling and bit depths across the codex, but with the 400 megabit codex, you can record up to 422 10-bit. The beefiest codec is a Cinema 4K 422 10-bit all intra 400 megabits a second downsample. This codec gives you the benefit of the full frame look and the added detail of a 6K downsample. These are some pretty decent codecs, and when you pair that with the VFR modes, there is some serious power under the hood. To put it in perspective, the internal XAVC codecs in the Venice top out 480 megabits a second. That's only 80 megabits more than the S1H. It's impressive what Panasonic have managed to get out of the sensor, especially when you pair these codecs with the variable frame rate options available also. When in variable frame rate mode, you can go up to 60 frames a second in 4K codecs, but the higher frame rate slow motion is in the bottom 4208 bit 1080p codec. Here you can go up to 180 frames a second. However, in this mode, you have a crop. To shoot in full frame, you'll have to drop down to 150 frames a second, which is in PAL, or 144 frames a second in cinema mode. Here is the full list of all the VFR options. We shot some tests looking at the difference in image quality between the cropped and uncropped slow motion using our trusty coffee machine. We recorded a couple of clips in three different frame rates, 125, 150 and 180 frames per second. The cropped in 180 looks a little mushier than the other two frame rates, but this is to be expected with the crop. The 125 and 150 however look great. We also shot some higher frame rate stuff with the fire spinners which we'll talk about in a bit. But how's the image? Well, I shot tests aiming to evaluate the image, dynamic range, color, as well as over and under exposure. I thought having a couple of other cameras to compare it to would be interesting. So we grabbed the S1H, A7 III, Pocket 6K, and Sony Venice. We shot using four Sigma 35 millimeters on each camera and positioned them slightly differently so we could do the take at the same time on each camera. The first test was outside with a color chart to showcase their dynamic range, highlight roll off, and color. Looking over the footage, as you would expect, the Sony Venice is the king, with much nicer highlight roll off and greater dynamic range. Looking at the other three, it gets pretty close, but the Pocket 6K has the benefit of having an internal RAW codec, so with highlight recovery on the Pocket 6K, this beats the S1H in regards to highlight roll off and detail. The S1H has a very good dynamic range and holds clear detail, especially when compared to the A7 III. One thing I also noticed was the difference in color on the trees. The Venice renders a much more accurate green than the other two cameras, which shift the greens more orange than the Venice. We then focused onto the over and under exposure tests and high ISO tests. We didn't use the Venice for either of these tests inside, but we still managed to compare the S1H, the Pocket 6K and A7 III. For these, we shot in our studio and used Aperture to control our ISO settings. We shot from 800 ISO up to 25,600 the S1H looks great at 800 through to 6400 ISO. At 12,800, it does get a bit dicey, but with a bit of denoising, it does get a bit better. One thing that is impressive with the S1H is how well it holds color. When comparing it to the A7 III and Pocket 6K, I think the S1H is the cleanest at 6400 ISO. However, I think the Pocket holds color and detail better than the S1H, but it's a lot noisier. The A7 III really shows its limitations here. Not only is it noisier at 6400 ISO, but the overall color and look is nowhere near the S1H and the Pocket 6K. After that, we changed up the lighting and then shot our over and under exposure tests. We exposed for the left side of James's face. The base exposure was f5.6, ISO 800, 180 degree shutter at 25 frames a second. We then used the aperture to control our exposure. We used our key light and light meter to go from three stops underexposed to three stops overexposed keeping all of our settings the same. Starting off with the S1H, it handles three stops of overexposure fine. You can pull back plenty of detail, which is great, but you can start to see the image breaking slightly. And at plus four, this would have completely gone. The S1H also handles color accuracy and saturation really well, up to three stops under and over. At four stops under, it gets extremely dicey and even showcases some CMOS smearing. Comparing this to the Pocket 6K, I think the highlights behave slightly better, but the image is much noisier. 
the A7 III is at the bottom of the pile with the worst performance in each area. We were lucky enough to be able to head down to South Bank and film with our friend Zen McPherson and at the London Fire Spinners meetup on the South Bank beach. We took the S1H with a range of kit, but limited it quite a bit because of it was only myself and James that could attend this shoot, and we needed to be as run and gun as possible because of it. We took our set of Zeiss Otis lenses and a 40mm Atlas Anamorphic. This way we could test shooting in both the spherical modes and anamorphic modes. We took a Sackler Ace XL as well as some basic rigging so we could shoot both handheld to test the IBIS and get some more stable shots. We headed down to South Bank to check out the location and capture a few shots during the gorgeous sunset. The tide was pretty high at this point so I was a little worried that the uh, meetup may get called off. But in the meantime we headed off to Waterloo to meet with Zen to shoot in Leak Street Tunnel. If you haven't shot fire before, it's much, much brighter than you think it's gonna be. So you can really have to choose between exposing your subject's face or the fire. I shot all of this at 4000 ISO using our Sackler Ace XL as well as handheld and used the iris to expose. We then headed back down to South Bank, really hoping that the tide had gone out a little bit and that people had started to turn up. Luckily, they had. Here we filmed entirely handheld. One thing that really impressed me on the S1 was the stellar image stabilization and it's great to see the same system being used during the S1H. This is super handy if you're trying to keep your rig nice and small and shoot handheld. However, if we had the crew, I would have much preferred shooting on a gimbal or tripod more. A few of the additional menu features came in really handy also. The first being the codec filtering system and custom codec list. I set up the camera beforehand with six codecs in the custom menu system. A 5.4K 25P codec, 4K 25P 17x9 down sample, 4K 50p cropped, a 1080p 25p cropped for variable frame rate mode, and both 25p and 50p anamorphic 42 10 bit formats. This meant we could easily switch between these four codecs without having to dive into the big list of formats. We also used internal focus peaking. This worked pretty well, but did play up a little in darker scenes, but it was all right. We also used the internal waveform to help with our exposure, but this was difficult with the burst of light from the flames. I also set the camera to shutter angle instead of speed to make switching between 25, 50, 180 frames a second much faster. I do wish, however, that I had a slightly more fleshed out rig for it. Even a couple of hand grips or a shoulder mount system would have been much easier to shoot with and less taxing. We did have a small HD Cine 7, which we mainly used during the bright outside scenarios due to the back screen of the Panasonic not being super bright for it. However, one issue I ran into was the Cine 7 not working with the HDMI output when down sampling or in 5.4K mode. But it did work in anamorphic mode. This may be because it's a pre-production unit. Panasonic only gave us one battery with the S1H, so we decided to shoot with an external USB battery bank in our pockets, going directly into the USB-C port on the side of the camera. Doing this method, we managed to shoot from around seven to midnight and only used up around three quarters of the internal battery as our external battery bank kept it charged. We shot in six main codecs. One thing that has frustrated me in the edit was the way the codecs handled in Premiere Pro. My workstation at home is no slouch, but I was even struggling to play back some of the footage at 16th res. This was so frustrating, I actually decided to transcode all the footage to ProRes 42HQ to make cutting everything together much easier, and it was definitely worth the extended coffee break. But however, once the footage got into our timeline, I was impressed with the image quality. Like we saw in the more controlled tests, the high ISO performance when using the full sensor is great. During the daytime stuff, I shot around 640 ISO, and as we hit dusk and night, I sat between 3200 and 6400 ISO. The only time the noise got a bit much for me was in the 180 frames a second VFR mode. This mode did not enjoy underexposed areas. We shot the entire piece in Vlog, and with a little grade in the resolve, the clips look great. Color is fairly similar to the very cam, which is nice. I really like the anamorphic footage that we captured with Zen in the Leak Street Tunnel. The half speed slow motion is fantastic. We also shot handheld and went in anamorphic, and I was surprised how good this looked considering how awkward this rig was for to use. The vlog handled really well in post. The image is just impressive. Well, that's our pretty comprehensive look at the Panasonic S1H. Panasonic aimed to create a full frame GH5 with this camera, and they've done just that. It hosts a set of features very similar to the GH5, just in a much bigger body and sensor. It has some really unique menu options and improved UI to make it more usable on set, a huge range of shooting formats, a tilty swivelly screen, great image quality with similar character to the very cam and incredible in-camera stabilization. At the moment, this is the go-to camera if you want the full frame look in a reasonably sized DSLR or mirrorless camera. I can see this camera being adopted by owner ops who use mirrorless cameras as their main camera and owner ops who own RED or ARRIES 
or other high-end cinema cameras wanting a camera they can cut with their A cameras and can put in more unique situations like car mounting without dealing with the bulk or worry of putting their larger cameras at risk. If you got this far into the video, thank you. This was a really long project, so if you enjoyed the review, please like, comment, share, and subscribe for more content coming soon.